Oh hi, I'm the heretic. As a Catholic, I want to understand the source of my doctrine and beliefs. If you're passingly familiar with Catholicism and Christianity, then you've heard of the Ten Commandments, a set of fairly simple and intuitive guidelines towards living a life closer to God. However, some are not as intuitive as others. Let's go over all of them and see what's up. For context, the Israelites are free from slavery in Egypt, having wandered the desert for 40 years. Apparently, they suck at navigation and started building the society again. Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to meet God, who gives him the commandments. Moses then climbs down and proclaims, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor, and do all thy work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, or his maidservant, or his ox, or his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thunderings, and the lightnings, and the noise of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they were moved, and stood afar off. So what does this mean? If you paid attention to the title of this video, I specified that I will be talking about the Catholic Ten Commandments. Yep, Protestants and Catholics can't agree on the Ten Commandments. What a shocker! I'll touch on them where they become relevant. As for the commandments themselves, when you really dig into them, they aren't just guidelines for virtue, but a set of guiding principles with real practical effects on yourself and your interpersonal relationships. Let's check it out. First commandment. I, the Lord, am your God. You shall have no other gods besides me. This is arguably the simplest, but also the hardest to describe commandment, especially to people outside Catholicism or Christianity. God is creator of the universe and our Heavenly Father, who spread us forth that we might inhabit the earth and find salvation at God's side. Note that the Protestants add another commandment after this one. You shall not make unto you any graven images. Graven images means man-made images. This references idol worship and the worship of statues and stone altars, which are sometimes empty, like the devotees don't know what they're worshipping. Catholics recognize this extra Protestant commandment and the first one as one in the same. Jesus explains in Mark 10, Oh, I can already hear that Jesus was a socialist type salivating. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying amongst themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. How often do they take the eye of the needle comment out of context? Anyways, in a sense, this commandment is a warning. Salvation comes through God. Salvation is only possible through God, not through images of silver and gold or on TV screens. Most importantly, salvation requires people to want to be saved. He can't save you against your will without violating free will. So if you seek your salvation through some other medium, then he can't help you. Some Protestants take this to mean that all religious imagery is a violation, which is absurd, as God himself commands the Israelites to violate this very commandment if that were the case. The point is that you shouldn't worship or serve these images. 
Not that you could ever hope to draw God. I mean, you could draw Jesus, who was man, or cherubim, or thrones. But God identifies himself as I am. How do you draw an I am? Obviously, graven images by themselves are not sinful. It's when you act in service to these idols that it becomes dangerous. Second commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain. This one is interesting because what vain means isn't completely clear. Merriam-Webster to the rescue. We can construe this commandment to mean to not take God's name in self-serving or pointless ways. This ties into the first commandment because evoking God's name for your own selfish purposes is to suggest that serving you, they are serving God, which is just absurd. That honor is unique to our Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Now how often do you mutter God or God damn it? I can't tell you to stop doing this as I myself play fast and loose with this commandment too. All I can say is that I am wrong for doing so and we should get better together. Third commandment, remember to keep holy the Lord's day. This commandment is the most often violated commandment, but it's also the most relatable. From a theist perspective, it's a time of rest and a time for contemplation and spiritual renewal. To draw us closer to God, from a more practical perspective, rest on the Sabbath day, that is to say the seventh day of the week, is how you avoid burnout. Now obviously, do not work on the Sabbath does not mean do nothing, as Jesus said it was appropriate to heal the sick on the Sabbath. The point is, make sure that if you are working, it's for God. And if you aren't, then do what relaxes you. This could be a hobby or something you just find fun. Which begs the question, if your work relaxes you, can you do it on the Sabbath? You know what? Why not? Go for it. Also, if you need to work on the Sabbath because you need to put food on the table, if your situation is that desperate, then God will understand. Fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Honoring your mother and father does mean respect is due. Your parents have experiences a child can learn from. A child needs a mother's empathy and a father's wisdom. Now, honoring something does not mean giving blind obedience. That's absurd. Learning from them means learning from their mistakes, too. After all, they're just people. If that mistake is a smoldering crater where your family unit should be, then the best way to honor them is to not repeat their mistakes. Virtue begins at home, and the advance of civilization is each successive generation being slightly better than their parents. Honor your mother and father if you wish to be honored by your children. Fifth commandment, you shall not kill. Another example of where Catholicism and Protestantism diverge. Protestantism says thou shalt not murder. Murder, of course, being different than killing. For example, self-defense that results in someone dying. Protestantism says this is justified, but Catholicism does not. To us, all life is worth protecting, and it's not our right to take. What's the justification for killing, then? To Catholics, there is none. Simple. Okay, but why is this the case? First off, you can't make the reverse statement, you shall kill, a consistent principle. The only consistent application of that principle is constantly killing, which creates inconsistency between the killer and the victims. After all, if you're applying the you shall kill principle consistently, then it's immoral to be killed. Because consistency is preferable to inconsistency, there's only two options, banning murder and banning killing. Non-murder can be consistent, but the question of what is murder leaves it open to different, sometimes inconsistent interpretations, which is bad. Obviously, this applies to don't stab people to death, but it also protects the sanctity of unborn life. That's correct. Abortion is murder, which is killing. The fact that some people regard abortion as their right only shows how far they've fallen. Sixth commandment, you will not commit adultery. The purpose of sex is children, and the optimal environment for raising children is a stable two-parent household. The best way to facilitate this is through marriage. This is why its sanctity is protected. When someone commits adultery, for a few minutes of happiness, they sacrifice the future well-being and happiness of themselves and their children for years to come. People are biologically programmed to pair bond in monogamous relationships, and children need an intact family unit, their biological mother and father. Seventh Commandment you shall not steal. This one is also self-explanatory. It goes something like this. You can't make you shall steal a principle because it makes the involuntary taking of goods between people an expectation. Therefore, it's not theft, now is it? Inconsistent. It's also a violation of the principle of self-ownership. You see, they use their time, labor, and effort to get that resource in the first place. To take it is to assume ownership over someone else's labor. That's slavery, and that's wrong communists. Eighth commandment, you shall not bear false witness. 
These self-explanatory commandments are quite useful. Some people interpret this to be the don't lie commandment, but that's not what it says. False witness is a specific lie. It's the government school teacher who diagnoses the boy who's bored to tears in her class with ADHD. It's the mattress girl being the victim of a non-existent rape. These actions have consequences, and they can absolutely ruin someone's life. Just ask the Duke lacrosse team. Ninth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Protestants lump this in with the Tenth Commandment on this list, but we'll get to that. This one has some overlap with number six, and I already explained why adultery is a problem. You see, adultery begins in the mind. When you lust after someone else's wife, even if you yourself are single, you torpedo that relationship, the stability and happiness of that couple's kids, current and future, for years to come. And for what? A few minutes of gratification? It's destructive, absolutely devastating, and it needs to be nipped in the bud. Tenth Commandment, you shall not cover your neighbor's goods. This is a fun one, firstly because Protestants lump this one in the ninth as one and the same. Secondly, people misconstrue this to mean thou shalt not covet. This is of course completely wrong. I've heard people say that capitalism and private property rights violates this commandment. Don't have much to say on Protestants lumping this and the ninth commandment together. As for thou shalt not covet, well, if God wanted to say that, he easily could have. No, he specifically said to not covet your neighbor's goods. If anything, this affirms private property rights. Don't take what doesn't belong to you. Why? Well, it's easier to just say that because God said so, than go into how self-ownership works. The point is, to want is normal, natural. But to want what others have because they have it, is to create envy. Envy leads to jealousy, and is the basis for all sorts of horribly destructive ideologies throughout history, like socialism. Take inventory of what you already have. It's so easy to take it for granted. I can guarantee you there's somebody out there who's envious of what you've got. Give thanks and be appreciative of the way things are. I'm not saying that you shouldn't want it to be better, but part of happiness is contentedness. And if you really want something, then work for it. Following these guidelines and you have the foundation of a virtuous life. The consequences of not following them might not be immediate, but as God alluded to, they will cause problems for your children and your children's children in the long run. But people will err. As long as you recognize your error and seek to be better, then all will be well. We all have a conscience, a little voice that's telling us what's right and wrong. All God is telling us to do is to listen, to step up and become the people we want others to be. Questions? Comments? Critique? How is my explanation of the commandments? Which commandment do you need to be better on? Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.